Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Ask Chrome. We're here at the 2019 Chrome Dev Summit, and we're ready to answer all of your web development questions live. To get started, we've got a list of questions that we've already asked on Twitter. Uh, but don't worry, if you're following along in the live stream, send us a question there, and we will do our best to get to it either today or tomorrow. Uh, I'm Jason, by the way, and this is not Rob Dodson. Hi, Sam. Hi. Good to see you. Um, yeah, sadly, Rob could not make it today, so you've got me instead. Anyway. Well, it's great to have you, Sam. Yeah, it's nice uh, to be. Without further ado, let's jump straight into our first question. Yeah, so uh, Giuseppe asked about the future of HTML. Now, this is a big topic, uh, as we know, and actually Nicole Sullivan from the Chrome team and Greg Whitworth from Microsoft will be giving an entire talk about this uh, on day two of the summit, yes. so make sure to check that out. But uh, without preempting this stuff, just a little high-level uh, overview of kind of four-part plan really looking into this. And uh, firstly, thinking about accessibility, um, you know, ways to uh, make the web more accessible by making some changes with uh, HTML and HTML implementations. Um, stuff like focus outline. Now, this is kind of, you know, a little outdated. It yeah. doesn't look great. It doesn't work really well anywhere. Yeah. We have some sort of basic problems like, uh, for example, in Chrome, you know, you have like a blue outline and well, you know, yeah, if the background is blue, that just doesn't work very well. Um, so, you know, we want to be able to uh, improve, in this case, outline uh, without people hacking stuff like right, getting- the whole outline yeah, done thing. Yeah, which is like everywhere, everywhere on the web now. Not and, great you know, for accessibility. No, <laughs> we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that. Um, Thinking also about uh, styling. So we want to provide some new hooks uh, for styling elements. You know, starting with, well, relatively simpler stuff like, uh, like checkboxes and radio buttons, right. and then you know, getting into more complex UI like select elements. Stuff like you know, the way you interact with, you imagine like if you've got an email app uh, and you want to add like email addresses, right. you get these nice little autocomplete thingamajigs, <laughs> and uh, you know we're thinking about new ways to uh, to kind of get really nice behavior with those uh, component parts. Right. So maybe ship a component on the platform that is basically an email to field or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. That would be nice. Yeah. I mean, we've had some great questions from yeah from Giuseppe and others. <laughs> thank you. About thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, <laughs> about like new accessibility features. Um, and I mean, like you say, there is some really interesting stuff in the works. Um, so first up, uh, one thing we definitely wanted to talk about is uh, the Accessibility Object Model, the AOM. Mm. Um, now, you know, assistive tech has always uh, had this kind of concept of the accessibility tree. Right. The tree behind um, the tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for those who, who don't know this, um, this is a way to represent the content uh, on a site so that, you know, maybe like uh, gives uh, you know assistive devices access to the content itself, which you know may not be so obvious from the DOM. Right. Now, what the AOM does is to provide new like developer-facing APIs um, that give you know more direct access to like to inspect and manipulate uh, this data structure, the AOM. The kind of core concept here is that. I don't know, you might want an accessibility object model that's different from the DOM. Mm. Uh, you know, you might want a different structure. Uh, you might want to be able to do stuff like add what we're calling virtual nodes uh, for stuff like a rich text editor. Mm. Now you think about this, you're building an app that's say using Canvas. Right. Uh, you know, like, what does the DOM look like? And- uh, There isn't one, right? <laughs> no, we need something different. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, like, yeah, the accessibility team here were pointing out, you know, you could use fallback content, but yeah, that's just not very pleasant, yeah, and that, that's kind of inherently a hack. Cool. So, with the AOM, you can create a virtual accessibility tree uh, that describes the content and also can change dynamically, right. which is really, really cool. Um, you know, that helps assistive technologies announce changes to content and provide like spatial navigation and so on. It's almost like a second DOM. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, so when we reached out to Chrome's accessibility experts, uh, they were super excited about a bunch of other APIs that are coming down the pipe, but the one that caught my attention was Focus mm -hmm. Visible. So um, Focus is sort of obviously an important part of browsing the web, especially when you're using assistive tech, um, but it turns out that managing Focus is extremely hard, 
Um, and also, it's it's sort of sometimes at odds with how we want to design things. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a core part of accessibility, isn't it? Yeah. Focus is a huge deal. It's yeah. it's step zero. Yeah. So. Uh, if you think about something like a text field, when you focus on a text mm -hmm. field, we have to have a visible indicator because we need to put the cursor in that field. You, you are going to continue interacting with that field. Mm. Versus if you think about a button, oftentimes when you focus a button, it's from clicking the button and then you're done interacting with the button. So we don't necessarily need to have a permanent visual marker that the button is highlighted. And so focus visible is, is like focus, but only in cases where we want to keep that focus indicator around. Right. Yeah. So there's this there's a trick that Rob was was telling us about uh, when we asked him about this, where if you're on a mobile phone with a soft keyboard and you tap something, if the soft keyboard comes up and stays up, that's something that is going to be focus visible. Yeah. So gotcha. we want to persist focus there. If you tap a button on a phone, we don't pull up the keyboard. Okay. Yeah. So that's sort of like the the little limerick. Um, yes. Yeah, so that that yeah. I, you know I thought that was a really interesting way to remember it. Um, so another accessibility concern was providing alternative text for content that is produced in CSS. So we all know, you know, the image tag has an alt attribute. Mm. Uh, you can provide fallback text there. We don't have alt for CSS, or at least we didn't have it until the CSS alt text API. Um, so this would be if you have like an icon font or uh, images that are being defined in CSS you could provide fallback text for those images without having to, to you know, breach into your HTML to do that. Yeah, another question we had actually from uh, Pim DeWitt on Twitter, thank you very much, uh, which is uh, yeah, asking about like, I have a draw with nav items that is initially inert. Uh, will its content still get picked up by crawlers since it is semantically hidden? Right. Now, the concept here, right, is a, uh, a menu that uh, may not be displayed initially until you tap on something like what we might call a hamburger menu icon. Burger, hamburger, Yeah, whatever, three whatever they're called, the thing with no name. <laughs> now, <laughs> anyway, um, now, like some of you may not know, but uh, HTML recently got a new attribute uh, on, on HTML element. Uh, that makes it possible to mark an element as being uninteractive. Right. And uh, you know that attribute is inert. Um, now, from an accessibility viewpoint, this is really useful. Oh, super useful. Yeah, because it makes it's, it's a way to make parts of the uh, the DOM like clearly be avoided uh, for anything that's like acting on behalf of the user. Right. So you know the inert uh, attribute just makes this really simple and I think kind of intuitive as a right. way of marking that content as something that is uninteractive. Right. It's there, point. but it's not tab navigable yes. or whatever. That's right. And so yeah. he was he was asking basically like if I if I use the internet action, yeah. if I do the good thing, um, is is you know something like Google search or, or whoever gonna pick that up. Yeah. Now the good news is that uh, yeah, search will still see your stuff. Right. <laughs> this doesn't make it go away as far <laughs> as search there. crawlers <laughs> are concerned. Um, and you know, of course, like web crawlers do benefit from semantic markup, but uh, you know, they uh, aim to discover as much content as possible. Right. So if you so, put your whole navigation in something that's inert, we're not going to not crawl it. That's it's right. Still there. Yeah. 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 So the answer to your question. Vim is, yes, search crawlers will see, see stuff even if it's inert. Yeah. Continue to use inert. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I put out a call for some performance questions. Um, and I got some really interesting ones, a lot of them from Greg. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> um, so he was asking a lot about networking performance. Um, and his first question was with regards to multiplexing in HTTP3. Uh, is there an upper limit to shared resource connections? So let's say you had 100 separate style sheets for 100 components or something along those lines. Uh, would you face a time penalty or performance penalty in time to first byte or other metrics for having so many style sheets? Um, and this one's it's a pretty easy answer. There is still per request overhead in HTTP3. Right. So the, the protocol has advanced. We have multiplexing. We can stream things concurrently. Um, but there is still headers in the request and the response for each request that you make. Um, and so HTTP3 reduces the amount of overhead, but it doesn't eliminate it. We, we can't fully eliminate it. Um, yeah, a so, request is a request. Yeah, right? it's, you're, you, you yeah. still have to have headers. If there's cookies, you still have to send yeah, the cookies. Yeah. So there, there will still technically be a penalty. It might be that the thresholds that you'd be working with here for like number of style sheets you'd want to ship on a page are higher. 
um, which is it's a it's a useful thing to have in the back of your mind, but they're not gone. Um, so a second one that he asked was uh, with regards to push headers and resource hints. What are they good for? Do they work? Do they help the user in any specific way? Um, so push headers are are pretty useful. Um, there's a new spec called resource hints that essentially lets you ship indicators of resources that you would like the browser to download before you ship the nice. rest of the request. Um, and the, the primary thing this is useful for is if you are preparing a page, let's say you're doing server-side rendering, uh, but you already know before you're finished the rendering that there's a couple resources the page is going to rely on. Maybe your, your CSS uh, that, you, that you inlined has yeah. some external assets, or you are doing server rendering of a single page application, and you want to start loading your JavaScript bundles. Um, so you can either send a push promise for this in HTTP2, or you know, coming down the pipe with this spec, you can send early hints with a link header that would tell the browser to go out and download that resource. Um, and so this is just a way for you to get those hints out before you start streaming the response and the browser has to start doing rendering work and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Just sort of moving the entire network of waterfall forward in time. Yeah. At least that's the goal. Yeah. I, right. I got one for you because oh. I believe you might actually be able to answer it. Mm. A question from Bitmotions with some long name. Um, what is, that is actually in their name? <laughs> yeah. I that's think amazing. So. It's pretty cool. Way to go, Bitmotions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And thanks, by the way, for the uh, the last all these questions on 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 the live stream. So the question here is, what is the longest method name in the browser API? So before I would have said, get bound in client rect, okay, which is long but easy to remember. Um, but no, uh, IG actually just announced a new API that I think takes the cake for this. <laughs> the API is called, is user verifying authentication platform available? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me get my head around that. Does what it says on the tin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sort of read it right to left. Yeah. Sounds like one of those German things where they take a whole phrase and they yeah, make it one word or whatever. Yeah. Massive portmanteau words. I yeah, want it. Yeah. I want it to be that the API has no capitalization. It's just all one yeah. word. Yeah. I think it is. It okay. is thankfully capitalized. Yeah. But. That's quite impressive, though. Yeah. Oh wow. I know one thing uh, you were going to talk about actually was uh, just mentioning about the Chrome Serial API. Right. Yeah. Somebody had asked. Uh, can PWAs with Service Worker access Chrome.serial API? Um, does this have the same or better ability to handle fast communication? Um, and you know, the same sort of conditions that Chrome Apps had. Uh, and my understanding is that the idea is that the Web Serial API should be able to handle everything that the Chrome Serial API mm -hmm. handled. Yeah. Um, and this is really important. It's like we want the web platform itself to have all of these great capabilities, yeah. not just Chrome. Um, that's uh, that's a very important constraint that we place on ourselves. Um, so there's, there, I think there's a talk at Chrome Dev Summit about Web Serial. Yeah. Uh, and I think I actually spotted over in the sandbox uh, there yeah. was some Web Serial stuff. I mean, if you're at the event, and apologies to those who aren't, but there's some like really nice uh, demos. But there's actually a code lab that goes with right. this. And you um, can do the code lab anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's really nice. You work with some uh, some components, which are pretty easy to come by. Yes. And yeah, cheap. it's beautiful. <laughs> cheap. cheap. Even. It's the USB cable that you've got sitting on your desktop. Yeah, um, it's like, yeah. yeah so we'll, we'll add a, yeah, a link to that uh, code lab so you can have a go with that. Definitely, definitely. So one last question. Time for one last question. Yeah, one yeah. last question. And you know, I noticed this on uh, Twitter earlier from Liz. Right. Uh, it's actually a question we've been asked a lot. Yeah, this is a super important one. Yeah, we get asked about this like many times. Every day. Many, every day, at least yeah. once or twice. Uh, so the question is, where did uh, where did you get all those sweet sweaters? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, for, for context, if you did yeah. not watch the opener, uh, yeah. you know, Mariko and Paul and and Surma and yeah. Jake have a they lovely matching beautiful set. matching sweaters, gorgeous uh, knit sweaters. What we call jumpers oh, in yeah. other parts yes. of the world. Sorry, jumpers. Yeah. Um, so the secret here <laughs> is that Mariko actually knits them herself. She is like she a does. professional knitter. Um, yeah. She's a machine. She's a knitting machine, you could <sighs> almost say. Yeah. Knitting Literally. machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's a complete pro. Uh, she, you know, I'm trying to convince her to knit sweaters for the rest of the team, <laughs> but I don't really have anything to offer her. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, 
Go and buck her and yeah, tell no, her to go get and buck me a sweater. Her. And actually, like, we will put a link here. She has an amazing <laughs> app, which is uh, called oh, the Knit. Patterns app. Yeah, it's called Knitlify. And uh, really like, good. as in, you know, well, as in knit Lify. with Lify yeah. on the end. Um, and you can use that to take an image and create a knitting pattern with it, Very which is cool. actually apparently what she used for the stuff that's here. So you two can build your own uh, kind of little dinosaur logo jumper. This is if I had the skill to be able to do knitting. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't, but yeah, I would like to pick up. A minor pattern. problem, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Marike right. is a yeah. She's a pro. She's, a, she's a pro knitter. Yeah, she is. <laughs> right. So the first question we're going to answer uh, today comes from Brian, who said portals, uh, and then he followed that up with, okay. <laughs> "I want to know about the devs. I want to know about the status of standardization. Um, I want to know about the objections of accessibility, potential for abuse, lots of different stuff." So uh, portals are a new thing. If you haven't come across them yet. Uh, the spec gives a really, really concise definition of what exactly portals are. So I'm going to read it word for word because it's very important. A portal is a browsing context whose portal state is set to portal. I love, I love spec language. It's like, it's like sort of legalese, but only more so. Wow. Yeah. What I don't, does that mean? I don't 100% know what that okay. means. Okay, right. Um, so what does that actually mean? So portals are a new navigational primitive. It's sort of like a hybrid between a web page and an iframe. Uh, and so with a portal, you can embed one page into another page. Uh, and then you can invoke, I think it's called activate on the portal. Mm -hmm. And that will promote the embedded page to be a new top level page. Mm -hmm. um, so you could totally see this being like useful for a product category page, let's say. Uh, you're going like an e-commerce site or something. And then um, you tap on a preview of some content yeah, sure. and, you, and you go to that page. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like they have this it's like quick view or, you know, like quick shop instant. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's these kind of flashy names. Yeah. Anything to avoid yeah. like a full page load, right? Well, yeah, yeah. And then you put a brand name on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. So there's a bunch of interesting use cases for portals. Yeah. Uh, we've got embedded widgets, search results pages. Uh, there's tons of these. So basically, anytime when you want to show most of another website or web page inside of your page, um, but tapping on that embedded content needs to seamlessly transition to the page without blanking the screen or being a jarring user experience. That's probably a use case for Portal. Um, it's also a potentially compelling feature for navigations within the same mm -hmm. website, not just cross websites, um, which is kind of cool. So Portals might give us a way to blur the lines a little bit between what you would think of as like a typical multi-page application versus a single page application. Um, it's possible that in the future we'll be able to animate between these things. So you can actually have like completely separate pages that load and unload like a multi-page site, but right. it's seamless client-side navigation. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, unsurprisingly, portals bring with them some challenges for accessibility. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the first reported issues we've just been looking at this uh, was that like portals aren't uh, keyboard accessible. Mm. And now that means that, you know, keyboard navigation users can't actually activate a portal by default. You know, you need to tap or click. That seems important. Uh, now, I think it, like it's possible to add event handlers in JavaScript, but this is kind of hacky. You know, it's not a good way of making things work. So we need to need to make sure that the API, you know, has that stuff in place without these kind of hacks. Mm. Um, also, another, I mean, there are multiple issues here, but <laughs> if you use the tab index attribute uh, to make the portal element uh, tab navigable. Oh, right, so you tab into it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that can actually have the effect of uh, like creating, you know, a tab trap. That sounds uh, terrifying. Yeah, it is. It I'm is. picturing myself it's surrounded like, by a I bunch know, of tabs. I know, I know. It's like not a bad place. <laughs> anyway. um, so where, yeah, this is where like focus gets moved into the portal, and uh, the user will get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and it, of course, it means you know you can't activate the portal. Okay. Um, so this is a problem too. You know, we obviously that uh, a bunch of these things that we're addressing. Um, on the question of abuse, uh, you know, portals are interesting. Interesting problem again. Um, you know, a couple of kinds of abuse that uh, we need to think of for like any feature like this. Right. Um, I mean, just in general, like so many things like overdoing it, just, you know, seeing everything as a potential like portal, like right. just adding too many portals. And yeah. image portal. Yeah, yeah. And like, I mean, you know, a portal is embedding like a real page. So like adding a hundred embedded pages is going to be really, really expensive. Okay, so it sounds sort of like 
the advice we're giving to people for portals is similar to what we say for something like Intersection Observer, where it's like, they're a great feature, they're really yeah. useful, please don't use a thousand of these. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just getting back to accessibility, um, Kevin uh, asked a question on Twitter about uh, an accessibility feature in the DevTools in mm. Chrome. Um, so he says, recently color accessibility was changed and now only checks the current element's BG color. Huh. Previously, it checked the BG color of its ancestors until it found something not transparent. I assume, is there more information on this? Right, yes, there is. <laughs> uh, we've actually spoken to uh, Paul Lewis himself, who works on the DevTools, which is great. So. Um, what this refers to is the uh, DevTools color picker um, and a bit of context to that. Uh, DevTools has to try to make like a best effort uh, when, you know, determining the background color. Right. Um, you know, and that, that's not always simple. That's hard. Um, <laughs> you can imagine, like there are situations where you have background images or you have, you know, multiple uh, layers where you've got DOM elements on top of each other and so on and so on. Right, so look, I had like fixed position text with a transparent background yeah. over top of an image. Yeah. When yeah. I scroll, the background color changes. Yeah, so exactly. That's so so what the DevTools did not want to do was uh, display like dodgy information. Right. So they kind of took it out um, yep. in those situations. Now, thankfully, we've just got a fix for that, uh, which Paul is just uh, implementing actually. Yeah. So even in cases where you know the DevTools aren't perfectly sure of the background color, uh, they'll still show you the contrast ratio in the UI, except just with uh, like a transparent background. Okay, so the button will still be there. Yeah, a it'll be yeah. proper or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll just be transparent. So it won't be just like, where did my ratio go? <laughs> it's just gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so Andrew, also on Twitter, I think he asked another question earlier. Um, yeah. He asked, when will PWAs be released in the Play Store? Which is a super interesting question mm -hmm. uh, that we have a solution for called Trusted Web Activities or TWAs. Yes. Trusted Web Activities is too long of a name. So as we know, web content has been sort of present on the Android ecosystem for a really long time via WebView and other solutions. Uh, and TWAs provide a high performance, secure, sort of user choice preserving way to build web apps on the web stack, but put them in the Android Play Store. Yeah. So right now, you can wrap up your PWA as a TWA and submit that to the Play Store. It can be downloaded and installed just like any Android app. Um, this is a little bit tricky because TWAs take a bunch of different forms. It's not just your app as an Android app. Mm -hmm. You can mix native UI with web UI and stuff. Um, and so there is a guide written by Peter on web.dev that basically walks you through the approach yeah. of taking your PWA and making a perfectly equivalent TWA for it. The yeah. one thing to remember with TWAs um, is yes. it is not just arbitrary web content on Android. Um, there is what we call installability criteria. Um, and sort of in short, this means you have to be a valid PWA. So in Lighthouse, you get the PWA check mark. Um, and you also have to have a performance score of 80. Right. So there's a bar yeah. there. Yeah. And we, we do this because we want to make sure that anything that makes its way onto the Play Store is meeting the same criteria that a user would expect of a native application. So we, we set a high performance bar. We set a high bar for making sure that the app works offline and effectively. Yeah, so, yeah. No, that's great. So that's to be TWAs. Yeah, what people expect from something they see on their home screen. Yeah, right. yeah it's exactly. going to work. It should launch, <laughs> yeah. show you the logo. Yeah, you're not going to see a dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. As fun as that would be. Well, you know, yeah, that's cool too. Yeah. We love dinosaurs. Anyway, uh, another Andrew question. Uh, will the shape detection API be released in M80? Mm. Uh, so, so first, just some background to this, because I really like this API. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we've had access to video streams uh, with Get User Media since uh, Chrome 21, I think. Wow. Uh, and image capture for still images uh, since Chrome 59. Mm. Um, now, the thing is, of course, there are lots of interesting use cases for analyzing the actual content of images, you know, stuff like barcode detection and text processing, which okay. is great. Yep. Um, we've actually had computer vision libraries like uh, OpenCV since the last century. Um, JavaScript ports of this. <laughs> that sounds weird to say. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. I looked since it up. Since the 1900s. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I looked it up. It's like 1999. Wow. wow. Anyway, so like the ports of this in JavaScript work pretty well, you know, yep. amazing. Um, but, you know, obviously for really fast and efficient uh, image detection, 
you know, we need to use hardware. Right. Uh, so that's where the shape detection API comes in. This uses hardware acceleration wherever it can. Sweet. Um, I think this yeah. works for face detection too? Yes, it does. That's right. Yeah. So now this is a little where it gets a little more complex. Um, so the original spec covers also text detection. Mm. Uh, but this is actually really hard to get right across platforms and character sets. Full OCR. You can imagine. Yeah. For like multiple character sets, multiple different. Yeah, you can Sounds imagine. cool. Yeah, it would be amazing. <laughs> anyway, the point is it's been moved to a separate spec of its own. Right. Um, shape detection for stuff like barcodes is actually going to be flagless in Chrome 80, which is fantastic. Sweet. Um, there's a very cool demo, by the way, uh, that uh, our colleague Paul Kinlan did. Uh, it's qrsnapper.com. Uh, you know, just for detecting QR codes. It just works really well. Actually a useful app. Yeah, yeah. Now check that out. Check that out. OK, so Rick on Twitter asked, can yes. we have an export to JSON option in the context menu of a variable? And so I'm assuming he's talking about inside of Chrome DevTools here. Uh, let's say, I think he gave an example here. So you console.log response data from an API call, sort of locked right. in the local variable of wherever it was set. Be really convenient to be able to right click that and say, copy or save yeah. as JSON, or get it in my clipboard, get it on disk. Um, so a lot of people don't realize DevTools has a copy command. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the console built-ins. So you just call copy like a function. Um, it's not in the menu or anything. You just have to know that it's there. It's yeah. sort of like an Easter egg. Like many things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for now, you can right click on the variable wherever you see it. So in the scripts tab or, or in the console, yeah. click store as global variable. And that will set it as like dollar sign temp one or something. Mm -hmm. You don't need to care about the name. Uh, you can just type copy brackets dollar sign underscore. Remember wow, that. That's almost like Perl. <laughs> yeah, it is almost like Perl. Um, <laughs> actually, I think, I think this comes from Perl. Uh, so, <laughs> and what that would do, it was it will copy the previous thing yeah. from the console to your clipboard, which in this case will be a JSON representation of the variable. Yeah. Copy converts it to JSON internally. So you can sort of do this today. It is not one menu item. It's a little bit of text. Fantastic. Fantastic. Cool. Microsites on Twitter, not sure yeah. what their, their name is, but that's their handle. Yeah, that's uh, cool. They asked, will Chrome 79 mixed content blocking also affect intranet sites? Uh, so they mentioned they heard this was going to affect in December, and then in January it would start fully blocking insecure content on secure origins. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I actually don't know what the proper timeline is for this, um, but I'm going to take his word for it. I'm assuming this is a thing that's coming soon. Um, the one thing that we do know is that Chrome has a, uh, uh, let me phrase this correctly. There will be an enterprise policy, likely called insecure content setting, that will give enterprise admins the ability to keep loading mixed content without the warnings or blocking. You should be radio announcer, Jason. That's actually my dream when I was a kid. <laughs> Yeah, you can like say do it. You can do like those weird warnings YouTube. that you get. Yeah. Coming soon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so generally, when it comes to feature rollouts like this, Chrome's you know, mission is let's provide an enterprise policy that helps with deprecations and removals. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, like if you have an intranet and you are relying on this and you, you, know, you have a separate timeline for when you want to upgrade that mixed content, um, we'll give you the option to extend that. Yeah. I think there is a thing as part of all this where we will try and auto upgrade HTTP content to HTTPS. Um, I have no idea what the constraints okay. are around how that works, but there's there's something there for that. So it might be that this is less of an issue than it seems like on paper. Okay. That's my hope. That's good. That's yeah. always good. Um, so yeah, we've I mean we've had uh, more great accessibility questions today. Uh, yeah. One from uh, Manoj, uh, who asked, would you consider adding an accessibility score that shows up whenever the dev tools in Chrome? is opened uh, cool. so that businesses provide time to developers to implement accessibility features. Uh, this is a really cool, idea. A cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, like anything that uh, exposes accessibility metrics is a great idea yeah. um, and to a wider audience. You know, we'd, we'd love to see accessibility scores uh, be more prominent when like, you know, with, like this business decisions are being made. Right. Um, you know, we'd like love to see those numbers in the boardroom alongside other stats that uh, people have for you know conversions or sales or even right. now performance. You know. Yeah, like we think about these things as developers. Yeah. But if your you know your C levels or your business folks or whatever yeah. aren't aware that your accessibility score is hurting your website, yeah. Then how do they make decisions? Basically? Yeah, and it's like damaging their business. You right. Know? 
Um, so obviously Lighthouse, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, has an accessibility score. Right. And you know, that's something you can like pull up in the audits tab uh, in the dev tools like today. Um, but you can also access that, of course, via uh, the uh, APIs and uh, with like Lighthouse continuous integration, um, yeah. which is something that uh, Elizabeth and Paul talked about yesterday, uh, day one from uh, Chrome Dev Summit. So do check out their report, uh, their, their talk about this. Um, we've seen some great examples of this, people using dashboards right. uh, and like making them easily available to people like throughout the company. You know, so you get like business, you know, better like business visibility. So you can see accessibility like a, numbers. A trend line of your yeah. website's accessibility score over time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Another thing to consider would be like, uh, normally with Lighthouse, we always talk about like pull up Lighthouse and run an audit of your site. Yeah. But your site is more than one page. Yeah. And when we do a Lighthouse audit, we're auditing one page. So mm. maybe for you in in your continuous integration setup or in your dashboard or yeah. whatever it is, when you run Lighthouse and you grab those numbers. Oh. Maybe it's not just for the homepage. Oh, th look, this is my bugbear. Like, yeah. like, please, when you use Lighthouse, don't just use your you know, Lighthouse on everything. Your homepage. Do it. Like, if you're on an e-commerce site, use your like check out your your category pages, your yeah. product pages, the checkout. your checkout flow, yeah. everything. Like, you know, it's it's a great idea to do that. How frustrating and, would it be to be an assistive tech user and you're you know you're you're shopping? Everything's actually pretty good so far. You've got tab navigation. Everything's working. You add something to your cart. You go to the cart. Yeah. Click the checkout button. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. focus the credit card field. <laughs> now that's interesting because we actually like we've off, what we've often noticed with performance is that what users notice is not necessarily like slow performance; it's performance differences. Right. So you go from a, like you see this regularly. You go from a fast home page to a slow, say, category page, yeah. and that's what users really yeah. get frustrated with. Yeah, and the picture of the site looked great, and then I waited. Yeah, five minutes yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so another thing, actually, we've seen with uh, with metrics like accessibility, I mean, which is pretty hardcore, but I like it, is you know that you display metrics over your website uh, internally, like in the office. Everyone, every time they go to your website, actually sees those numbers on the site. I love this idea. Yeah. So you know, it's literally in your face. I want that um, for like accessibility, yeah, performance, yeah. everything. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great idea. And it's, you know, it's a great way of just getting things beyond engineering. Right. Now, that way engineering. When, when everybody else at your company is browsing the site, they see these things front and center. Yeah. And they see you like make improvements so you like, you know, had impact and <laughs> true. things work. Look, you know. I'm valuable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. So uh, Christian asked, um, is there such a thing as send this link to desktop from your phone? Mm -hmm. Right. We know that there's, you can right click on a tab in Chrome for desktop and say, send this to phone. Yeah. Do we have the opposite? And so originally, we were really sad about this question because we thought that the answer was no. Yeah. Um, turns out that's totally wrong. We were looking in the wrong place. Uh, the answer is yes, we have this feature. We do. Uh, no one who we talked to knew about this except for the person who implemented it. Yeah. Uh, so it's always right to know the yeah. right people. You know, tech we support. go backstage, we yeah. ask them, we find out ourselves. Yeah. So uh, on Android, if you tap the share menu, right, the three dot menu, click share. There is a Chrome logo that says send to your devices, or at least it would say that, except on Android, we truncate the text. Uh, so it just says send to. Yeah. Uh, which is a little bit confusing, although it is open ended. We don't know what device you're mm -hmm. sending to. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so you tap that, and it lets you pick the computer to send the tab to mm -hmm. exactly like it does with the phone, and yeah, then cool. it shows up on your computer. Yeah, and I think that like, the Chrome team is working to make it, you know, yeah, like. It, just to improve the UI UX yeah. for this. But it's yeah. there. Yeah, it no, actually it's works, works really well. I yeah, used to no. send this document to my computer. Yeah, it's amazing. It works really well. Yeah. Um, we have Do like time? we have yeah, we've yeah, got a, a couple minute. of minutes. So we'll actually take like uh, one question we've got here off. Uh, I'll do this one about uh, from uh, Elio oh, Cookies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, do Elio's it. a Braun Brown. Um, the question is, is there a way to set a breakpoint on cookies so it breaks when a cookie is set, changed, mm -hmm. deleted, either by HTTP header or via JavaScript? Uh, now, in the console, you just showed me this because I thought, you know, I was, I was looking at the copy this? function, if I'm honest, and I saw this man. No, this is, this is cool. <laughs> so you can use debug in the console uh, and like pass document.cookie to that. Um, also, you like you were showing me just just before, like in the network right. tab, uh, it's like has response header uh, set cookie. Um, One of the Easter egg search. Yeah, specifiers. yeah, exactly. One yeah. of the many magic things inside DevTools. DevTools docs do have 
things for both of these. Um, but really, what, what you're saying is you can use debug to install a breakpoint for document yeah, key. That's right. There's your JS version. Yeah. Uh, get set delete. And then you can use the, the filter in the search tab of the network panel to do yeah. the, the network version. Yeah. So Perfect. That gets you both. Yep. I mean, just, yeah, thanks again for all your questions. So it's been fantastic. Uh, please feel free to send you know, more questions on Twitter using the Ask Chrome hashtag. And we'll do our best to uh, get responses from the Chrome team. We promise to do that. And do stay tuned for more episodes of Ask Chrome that will be coming up in the future. Great. From myself and Sam, thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, thanks very much.